Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. Hello all, it's 27th of April and I'm going to give you another quick update on the current challenging situation. And this addresses a common topic out there, vitamin D and its interaction with your exposure or your the severity you may experience with this uh, viral problem. So we're going to look at a few slides here and the first is around a new study that came out from the Philippines from a doctor there, radiologist, and it's a simple study and it just looks at the severity of uh, these viral outcomes versus the vitamin D historical status of the people in question. So it's only a couple of hundred people, you can see the title here, and it did look at their prior vitamin D levels. So it's not just post admittance when they had the virus, uh, it looked at historical and post admittance. So that's kind of controlled for. So essentially, here's the result. And we see that as an association, it's very powerful. So it is associational data, retrospective, but we see that mild cases overwhelmingly were above 30 nanogram per mil, which is sufficiency for vitamin D, pretty much accepted. And then as you get to ordinary cases and severe particularly and critical indeed, you see that these cases are dominated by an association with insufficient or deficient uh, D levels. So it's quite a strong signal, uh, albeit associational. Now, if we look here, Elizabeth Brown actually replotted the data for us. Thank you, Elizabeth. And you can see again, the mild outcomes average 30 something uh, nanograms of vitamin D and increasing severity of outcome much, much lower, right down to uh, deficient on average for the critical cases. So she also put the percentage of Americans and ethnicities who are in these or the very low 19.6 or below kind of level of D uh, and there are substantial percentages of the population who are now D deficient, uh, as you can see. So a lot of chatter also on Twitter from doctors who are dealing with patients with this issue. And again, comments that they're not seeing anyone above 40 in the case of this tweet, uh, but certainly above 30 seems to be very rare. But again, part of that is that the population is so low. So let's go on to another study just out yesterday, I believe, and I'm going to leave the baseline characteristics here, but basically it's 780 people who came in, actual viral cases, and it looks at the overall demographics of them, but it also looked at their vitamin D historical status. And the difference with this one is they did do some analysis where they corrected for age because older people will tend to be lower in D because of not getting exposure to the sun, less is generated in older skin, etc. So part of the association will undoubtedly be that older people more likely to have severe outcome and older people have lower D. So it's a confounding. So many confounders in associational studies, but here they corrected. So let's take a look. So basically we see here from the 780, a normal level of vitamin D is set to a risk of one, a hazard ratio or an odds ratio of one. Uh, so they're the baseline and we compare against them. Insufficient people, had around 12 times more likelihood to have death from this virus. It's just very substantial associational risk multiplier. And deficient people in vitamin D had nearly 20 times. So this has been commented on in the British Medical Journal uh, in letters written in because it is very striking. But remember, I did say to you it's associational and also that age is going to confound it, among other things. So let's look at their correction for age. So here's where they corrected for age, sex and comorbidity. Now, this is really interesting because if you correct for comorbidity, you're going to really drown out a D signal, perhaps a little unfairly. But they, they corrected for all of these here, including the important age. And what they saw, of course, was the numbers became lower, the relative risks, as you will always see when you correct for other factors. What's interesting, though, is insufficient were still nearly eight times higher likelihood of death. And deficient people below 20 nanogram in D status were still 10 times more likely to die. So although it's associational, this is corrected in regression for some significant confounders and um, a 10 times 
risk for death is a very large associational risk. So to give an example, we are happy around the world to say that meat probably causes cancer, but the risk ratio is around 1.1 or 1.2 in associational studies, which is obviously ridiculous. And even hypertension for heart disease or heart attacks is around 1.8 risk multiplier. And we take that really seriously. But this is a 10 times. So just keep that in mind. So we'll look now and we'll investigate a little the potential reasons why this person above 30 has 10 times less risk of death for the infection than this person who's below 20. It's not just because they chugged some vitamin D pills. No, 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 no. So we have to look at what would potentially make this person the person that they are, who, who happens to have over 30 and be much, much safer. So we look at a couple of things. One thing is if the person is eating more nutrient dense, particularly animal products with D in them, uh, and is eating really healthy food and lifestyle, they'll tend to be higher in D because it's a marker for many, many things. So that's one reason why they might be higher and safer. Another reason is if they avoided insulin resistance or leptin resistance, Okay, if they lived a lifestyle where they had no diabetic dysfunction, certainly their D would be higher. Many people with diabetic dysfunction show D that's incredibly low because it's actually a marker for these kinds of problems. Okay, if they avoided inflammatory conditions and inflammatory milieu in their body through diet, lifestyle or whatever other means, living healthy, they would tend to have a higher D status. And this is established in the literature without any question. If they got more sun exposure, healthy sun exposure with no burning, right? That's obviously going to make them be higher D. So they could be this person, okay? With the association of much, much lower risk. So that's, that's another factor. And I will mention that, yeah, if they took supplements, they'd have a higher D status. But a note of caution there, that if you push up your number with just, say, pills, that's not necessarily going to make you the person who is at much lower risk, or, or greatly so. Uh, I'd more concentrate on the first four there. And there are others, but it's important to add it in because technically it is a way you'll end up with a higher number. Um, so it's important to be complete here. So around oh, six years ago in 2014, I did an extensive lecture on the science of vitamin D in uh, your immune system, in general health, in modern chronic disease. And it's over an hour long, I think, uh, but it's on YouTube there. You can find it, Vitamin D Debacle. And I called it Debacle because I had personal family situations with my children. Uh, one of whom got very, very ill, had to be hospitalized, and they discovered only then that he was profoundly deficient in vitamin D and urgently had to take uh, supplements. And I was shocked at the time, and it was many years later I actually investigated the science. So it's quite personal for me, um, this, this area. Okay, so anyway, that video is there if you want to go and watch it. Uh, and there's a lot of the science discussed, but we'll go through some basic slides from 2014. So the first thing is to look at our human evolution. We came out of uh, Africa. This is not disputed. We had very, very dark skin pigmented because the UV was so powerful. So we still got vitamin D from the sun, but at a reasonable rate uh, rather than getting too much. And we were protected from the negative effects of uh, powerful UV. But as we migrated all over the world, we went out, you can see the red zones and orange, there's much less UV availability during the year. So we lost our pigmentation and it's broadly accepted because we didn't need the protection and the whiter skins would get more vitamin D in areas with lower UV. So not too contested. An interesting thing maybe people might observe is that a lot of the areas being less hit by this uh, current problem, they do happen to be in high UV areas, but that's just a correlation. So if you look at the map there, and even Australia have just come out of a long summer, right? So they would have got a lot of, 
a lot of um, kind of de-boosted for many people. But that said, the modern people wear much more in the way of clothing and avoid the sun. So this factor won't be as big as the latitude might indicate. But that's the history. The Maasai, lovely little study I showed back then, their cousins, the Bantu, you know, genetically the same, but they're kind of more city dwelling and modernized. They have a D down around 20 something. But the Maasai are actually a median of 42, right? So you can see there, most of them will be well over 30, right? So that's an ancestral D, even in a dark pigmented skin person because of their local environment, which I mentioned. So 42 is, you could call it ancestral. Uh, Wyoming athletes had another study, and these are Caucasians, but you see, because they're out running in the sun, getting healthy sun, the men are around the 40 odd median, 45 actually, and the women are higher at around 50. And there's physiological reasons for this, which I explained, and the science is understood. Women are slightly different, and they tend to come to a different point. But the main thing is D is up in the 40s and beyond for more ancestrally behaving humans, shall we say. And I'm sure they're eating pretty well too, these guys. An unfolding catastrophe, and I kept the title of my original slide here, might be a bit dramatic, but what we see here is NHANES 88 to 94. And we've also got NHANES in a moment, I'll show you, 2001 to 2004. So this is a sampling of the population and will be very accurate in terms of D status. And the y-axis shows the percentage above 30. And as we showed from the virus studies at the start, being above 30 would be the threshold to be thinking about from the associational studies. So here we have it, age on the left. So what happened over only around a, a decade or so or 15 years maybe, is we've dropped massively in the percentage of people over 30. Now there's reasons for that which I'll get into in a moment. In terms of sex, men and women both suffered, you know, there was no uh, discrimination there. And race ethnicity is really interesting. So white or Caucasian dropped a hell of a lot, but if you notice the black people here in America were already very low, like only around 12% above 30 nanogram compared to their cousins, uh, the Maasai. But they dropped to below 5% above 30 nanogram, which is pretty astounding. And Mexican American and others, uh, similarly, a huge drop from a low start point. So you will have also seen that with this current issue, there's ethnicity showing up. And part of that is obesity and metabolic syndrome, certainly. Uh, but it's interesting to see it here too. A quick reminder of the Maasai, the evolutionary level up of 42 median. So on this graph, where the Maasai would be is kind of up here. And in fact, they kind of blow the scale on the graph because they'd be that much higher or number above 30 that uh, they blow the top off this graph. So you can see the comparison there. I went through lots of papers back in uh, 2014, but there's some great stuff out there, tons of it. And this paper is very interesting to look at how vitamin D interacts with all of our hormones, our immune system, and it just interacts with so much. It's actually quite dizzying. Uh, but again, you could look at some of those papers. But I also emphasized back then uh, this problem that we now, if you want to be above 30 ancestrally, and you could argue it's 45, that's where the rate limit of the uh, reactions in our body level off your D status and don't increase it anymore. Okay. But let's say 30. Well, around 70% of the US population is now below 30. Okay. And that is quite striking. I, I hope you'll agree. So let's look again at what causes a person in general, there are myriad causes, but what would cause a person to be in the above 30 group that apparently in associational studies, even with correction, might have 10 times less risk. And you can imagine if everyone was up here and if the studies bore out, how much smaller this issue would be. So it's an interesting philosophical question. So we'll say nutrient dense uh, foods, you know, with D included and many other healthy aspects uh, would, would help a person to be in that group. Also not having insulin resistance. 
And that does link to the first one, of course. If you only eat healthy, wholesome, real foods, you're much less likely to be insulin resistant. And insulin resistant people are going to show low D. So you avoid that. If you avoided inflammatory conditions, you know, and again, that'll tie to diet and other things, you will tend to be in this group. Uh, if you get healthy sun exposure with no burning, ancestrally, you will tend to be in this group. And of course, if you supplement, you'll tend to be more likely to be in this group. But just a little caveat again, that it may not be bringing the same benefits that this group appears to have as these good things would bring. But I'm sure it's a good idea for people who are insufficient or low to kind of accelerate themselves to getting into a, a more ideal situation. So basically, I'd ask the question philosophically now, you know, have we, have we bought something over the last 40 or 50 years that you see in the data? Have we actually bought something unwittingly? And is it possible that we're now kind of having to pay the bill? Um, so that's just to end on a philosophical note. And of course, uh, these free podcasts and published uh, data interpreted and explained all come free for quite a long time now. You can support us to continue to do so by going to extratimemovie.com and streaming our new movie on heart disease reversal, which is actually quite connected to this, you'll see. Uh, for $3.99 and download for $9.99 even better. So that would really help support us and it would also help to share that website extratime or extratimemovie.com with as many people as possible because we go through heart disease, why it occurs, we scan a load of Irish sports stars, we discover people with serious issues that were unknown and they got follow-up care. So that's a very important aspect. But we also followed one hero who applied all of what the science would say in order to stop and perhaps even reverse his heart disease progression. So great if you could help us with that. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen and go to extratimemovie.com to see our fascinating new documentary on stopping and reversing heart disease.